Okay, so just to kind of remind you a little bit of what happened two weeks ago, in case you know it's been a while. Okay, so then last week we said the following. It was uh, several things. So first, if we have, if we are given a smooth function f of x and y, then one, critical points of f of x and y are when what? How do you, how do you find the critical points of a function? When, ah, <laughs> so it has been a while. Okay, so how about how about in calculus one, if I give you a function, how do you find the critical points of that function? Where the derivative is zero or undefined. But if the function is smooth, then what does that mean? I mean, there's no places where the derivative is undefined. Okay, so then the critical points of the function f of x and y are when something <coughs> is zero. What is zero? both partials. So then you can summarize that by saying <coughs> the gradient of f of x and y is the zero vector, which is to say that the x partial is zero and the y partial is zero. And they must both be zero. Okay, so any questions concerning this statement? So we found the critical points of several functions last, you know, in a previous lecture. Okay, second. Okay, the critical points can be classified with the second partials test. they can be classified with the second partials test. So specifically, if x0, y0 is a critical point of f of x and y, <coughs> and the second partials are continuous, so if all of this is true, if all of this is true, so notice that if the second partials are continuous, that means that the first partials uh, must also be continuous, okay? Which means that the function is smooth, which means that all critical points are where the gradient is zero, right? There aren't any where, uh, there aren't any at corners and cusps and things like this. This is a smooth function. Okay, so if this is the case, then we will define. h, little h, equal to the determinant of the following 2 by 2 matrix. So fxx evaluated at x0, y0, fxy evaluated at x0, y0, fyx evaluated at x0, y0, and fyy evaluated at x0, y0. Okay, so this, these bars don't mean absolute value, they mean determinant, so it means the product of the unmixed partials, the product of the xx and the yy partial, minus the product of the yx and the xy partial, the mixed partials. So then, tell me how fxy and fyx are related. The, they're the same, right? They're the same. Is it true that the mixed partials x, y, and y, x are always the same? No, not always the same, but if the second partials are continuous, then they're the same. Okay, so then these, these two ones are the same. So then, uh, you know, not for any bonus points, but for a good job, why is this called h? Why is this called h? 
you know, instead of some other thing like Q or whatever. Because, because this right here, right, the gradient of a function is a vector. It's a vector, right? So in a sense, the gradient is standing in for the derivative of this function. So now we have, we're speaking of the derivative of this function, and it is a vector. Well, how many second, how many second partials does this function have? It has four of them, and they are, they are all appearing here. So this matrix this matrix is the second derivative, is the second derivative because it contains all of the second derivative information. So then it has a name, right? The, the first derivative is called the gradient. The second derivative is called the Hessian. Okay, the Hessian after a famous mathematician named Hess. Okay, so then you, it is frequent to call the second derivative capital H. Okay, but this is the determinant of the second derivative, so I'm calling it little h. Okay. So does everybody remember this discussion? Or, or maybe that it happened, but maybe not the specifics. <laughs> okay, good. So then, since x0, y0 is a critical point of a smooth function, and we have defined h, we can now classify it using the second partials test. The second partials test says the following. If h is positive, Then, what is the interpretation of H being positive? The concavity is consistent. Right? It means that no matter which direction you measure, the concavity always has the same SIGN. Okay, so then, that means that this place is going to be what? What kind of thing? It might be concave up. Could it be concave down? Yeah, it could be concave down, right? It could be concave down in all directions. It could be concave up in all directions. So there are, if you determine that H is positive, then there are two possibilities. If FXX evaluated at X0, Y0 is negative, then that means that there's negative concavity in the x direction, which means that there's negative concavity in all directions, which means that <coughs> uh, x0, y0 is a max, a relative max. Okay, so then you can use any unmixed partial here. So I used the xx partial. What else could you have used? The yy partial. Could you have used the xy partial? No, no, no. You couldn't have used the xy partial. Okay. Alternatively, if you determine that the an unmixed partial is positive, then the concavity is consistent and one of the unmixed partials is positive, then the critical point x0, y0 is a relative min. Okay. <coughs> so, you might wonder, you might say that, well, what about the possibility that one of the unmixed partials is equal to zero, right? Could it be that one of the unmixed partials is equal to zero? What would that mean? So, it, it's impossible according to the conditions set forth. So, if xxx of x, x0, y0 is equal to 0, then what would that mean? That would mean that what would the determinant h be, right? It would be 0 times something, right? It would be 0 and then minus something. 0 minus something. So, the greatest that could possibly be is 0 if it was 0 minus 0, but then h wouldn't be positive. Right, so then this case is simply impossible. It will never occur. If it does occur, that means that you have made a mistake. <coughs> okay. So, the determinant might be negative. The determinant of the Hessian might be negative. So what does this mean about the concavity? It's not consistent. This means that there is a direction you can choose where the concavity is positive, 
and there's another direction you can choose where the concavity is negative. Okay, so then that means that the sign, the SIGN of the concavity depends on the direction you measure. Such a point is called a what? Saddle point. Okay, and then the last possibility is that if the determinant of the Hessian is zero, then what? Then there's no conclusion. No conclusion. So then solving a problem like this basically comes down to the following procedure. I give you a function you compute the gradient of that function and solve the gradient of that function is equal to zero. If the function is a function of two variables, then how many components does the gradient have? Two, right? Two, and you want to set each one of the components equal to zero, so that's solving a system of two equations. Right, so if I give you a function of two variables, you have to solve a system of two equations. Okay, what if I give you a function of three variables? Then you solve a system of three equations. Right, each one of the components equal to zero. You will get a short list of critical points. Okay, like <coughs> at most four, at least one. Right, there'll be at between one and four critical points. For each one of those critical points, you'll need to use the second partials test and say, ah, well, this one is a relative max for these reasons, and that one's a relative min for those reasons, and this one is a saddle point for these reasons, and this other one I can't classify because the determinant of the Hessian is zero, blah, 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 blah. Does everybody remember the way that goes? Okay, so any questions about this procedure? Okay. So I hope this has brought you back into the swing of things, out of the break. <coughs> so then today we need to talk about something else. Okay, so that the procedure we just look at, looked at, the second partials test, mm, has the purpose of uh, telling you how to optimize the function right, of two variables. Okay, so then that it helps you to find the extremal points. But sometimes when you want to solve a problem, uh, it's not quite as simple as what is presented in that particular setup. Okay, so then that setup is called an unconstrained, an unconstrained optimization because what it's saying is that the critical points are allowed to occur anywhere. And they can be just anywhere that you want. Okay, so then <coughs> there are plenty of problems that do not satis that that do not have that property. So then it may be that okay, I want to here's a typical problem. I want to find the best house I can buy for less than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Right. So then two hundred fifty thousand dollars or less. Right. That that problem. What is the two hundred fifty thousand dollars or less? That that is called a what? A constraint, right? It's a constraint, and that's a <laughs> typically fairly reasonable constraint. Right, so I want to find the best, the best situation, the best product I can buy according to this constrained cost. Okay. Alternatively, another version of constrained optimization is to say that I want to find the tallest mountain on the Earth. Okay, and then it would. And then, you know, a good response, the correct response would be something like Mount Everest. Right? Mount Everest is the tallest mountain on the earth. Another response that might seem good but simply isn't correct is Mons Olympus. Mons Olympus is the tallest mountain in the solar system. However, what planet is it on? Mars. Right? <coughs> Mons Olympus is the tallest mountain in the solar system, but it's on Mars, so then you didn't satisfy the constraint. Right? So does everybody understand that today we're going to solve problems that have constraints? Okay, good. So then, <coughs> solving problems that have constraints can be done if the, if the problem has a special form using something called Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so then, <coughs> specifically, Lagrange multipliers can solve the pro can solve the constrained optimization problem when the function to be optimized is smooth and the constraint is also smooth. 
basically what that means is that all the derivatives will be defined. And we don't have to worry about the derivatives being undefined. So then this is a smooth <coughs> constrained optimization technique. So probably the best way the best way to go about doing this is <coughs> with an example to introduce it. Okay. So here's an example problem. I'm drawing a axis. Okay, on this axis I'm going to draw a an ellipse. Okay, and this, this ellipse is symmetric about the axis, my drawing notwithstanding. Okay, so there's an ellipse. So now what I'm going to say is... Whoa, can you see that? What is that? Uh, how do I make it go away? Oh, press the X. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so then now what I'm going to say is is, okay... I'm going to consider a point okay that is on the on the ellipse. Okay, so then so then that's the constraint. Right? The point that I choose has to be on the ellipse. Can't be off the ellipse. It has to be on the ellipse. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to in a sense move this point around. <coughs> so now I I'm going to say the following. It I choose this point and I want it to be in the top right quadrant. So this point right here, XY has to be on the ellipse and in top right quadrant. So then from this point I can make three other points, right? With a horizontal line, I can go over here and make this point. Okay, and then <coughs> with a vertical line, I can drop down here to make this point. And then I can drop down here to make the symmetric point. Like so. Okay, so then those other three points that I drew, they're all determined by the first point, right? Using that you know, horizontal and vertical lines. So as I move the as I move the point in the top right, then the other points will also move. Okay, so then now this shape inside of the ellipse is a rectangle. Right? It's a rectangle. So then in particular this rectangle has an area associated to it. So here's an interesting question. Where should I put the point x, y in the first quadrant so that the rectangle that is inscribed by the ellipse has the maximum amount of area? Right, so, for example, if I, was to take, if I was to take this point and sort of move it this way and take it to the x-axis, what would the area become? It would become zero because this would become a very short, right, like a pizza box rectangle, this, the profile of a pizza box. Okay, and then eventually the area would go to zero as the point goes to the x-axis. Okay, so what if, what if instead I take the point and I move it toward the y-axis along the ellipse, what will happen? The area will again decrease to zero because it will become a tall, skinny rectangle and the area will go to zero. So then, you know, it sort of stands to reason that there's, there's got to be some point in here, in between these two boundaries, right, that one and this one, there's got to be some point in there where the inscribed, or the, yeah, the inscribed rectangle has a maximum area. So does everyone see the problem that we're trying to describe? Trying to be described. Okay, so then, how do you solve this problem? So it can be solved with the method of Lagrange multipliers. <coughs> so then now let's give in order to make some of the computations more clear, let's give each one of these things uh, a name. 
<coughs> so this is the point f of x and y. Th let's say that this is the ellipse, and the ellipse is given by x squared over 3 squared plus y squared over 4 <coughs> squared is equal to 1. <coughs> x squared plus 3 squared x squared over 3 squared plus y squared over 4 squared. So then now, let's say that this is the point, right? This is the point x, y. So then tell me, what is this, what is this height? What is the height of this? 2y, right? Because it's, it's y in this direction and y in that direction, so altogether 2y. Similarly, What is this width? 2x. So then, for that reason, we can say that the area of the rectangle is, I'll call that function f of x and y, it's equal to base times height, which is 4xy. Okay, so any question about that? <coughs> So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the constraint <coughs> is g of x and y is equal to x squared over 3 squared plus y squared over 4 squared minus 1 and g of x and y is 0. Right, so all that is, is I'm saying that, okay, instead of taking the constraint equation, I'm going to make a new function from it by, by moving all the terms from one side to the other, okay, and then saying that actually the constraint is a function, and I'm considering when that function is 0. Okay, so if I give you a function, if I give you a function, we consider when that function is 0, then that's called a what? of that function, a hmm. so like for example if I was to take this table right, and I was to sculpt for you some sort of nice <coughs> surface right, and I was to say let's consider all of the points that are at height zero and I make a cut at height zero then the, the thing that we would be looking at is called a what? an isocontour an isocontour. Okay? So then that is to say we're encoding the constraint as a constraint func as the zero contour of a constraint function. And so now here's where things start to get a little bit abstract. Okay. <coughs> so then now f of x and y is 4xy. Now what is this if you were to plot some level curves of 4xy? So let's make some observations. One, the level curves <coughs> or, the is or the isocontours or whatever you want to call them of f of x and y are what? So if you were to just take a level curve C, then you would solve the equation C is 4xy. Okay, then I could solve for y and say that, well, y is equal to uh, what? C over 4x. So I'll just say C over 4 times 1 over x. Okay, so C over 4 is just some constant. Okay, so then let's ignore it for a minute. What does the graph of y is 1 over x look like? A hyperbola, right? A hyperbola. It looks like this. Uh, no, not this, like that, like this. Right, so does everybody remember that from college algebra or whatever? Okay, so then that's what all of the constraint curve, what all of the level curves of the optimization function are. Okay, so then how about how about the level curves 
of g and x of x and y. They all look like what? They're all ellipses. <coughs> okay, so then. <coughs> The solutions which satisfy satisfy the constraints are intersections. Of these things. Right? They're intersections of hyperbolas and ellipses. <clears throat> okay, so what we need to do is we need to figure out, in a sense, what, what particular hyperbolas <coughs> and ellipses give us the best, the best solution. Because there are plenty of solutions. There are pr plenty of solutions inscribed rectangles, but only one of them is going to have the largest area. So, <coughs> so... The ellipse that we are interested in, we're not interested in just any ellipse. We're interested in the in the uh, in the zero contour, right? The one where the the constraint function is at the zero contour. So you have something that looks like this. Okay. So then. So then here's a particular ellipse. <coughs> I mean, uh, this is the zero ellipse, and here's a particular hyperbola. So how many intersections are there <coughs> on this particular one that I've drawn? Two, right? There's two. So here's one possible solution, and here's another possible solution. Now let's look at them and see what rectangles they correspond to, right? That would be this rectangle. my drawing was better. <laughs> You're just going to have to use your imagination with my drawing here. Okay, or this rectangle. <coughs> right, so then, do you think that either one of those are the largest, the, the rectangle with the largest area? No, probably not, right? Because it seems to me that if I was to take another, if I was to take another ellipse, <coughs> uh, like so, or not another ellipse, but another hyperbola, and I could say, Okay, so then instead of that one, maybe I'll choose this one, where it just touches the one time. Right, so then in a sense, the pink point here, right, the pink point here, and the green point here, right, I've moved, I've considered another isocontour, another hyperbola, by moving this one out. So I'll draw the previous one here. Right, so here's the one that I drew on the previous, <coughs> the previous one, and here's another one. So here, this is going to be the best one. Right, that's going to be the best one. That is the <coughs> hyperbola that just, just barely fits the constraint. Right, so it's the one that we just we moved the the area function, the isocontours of the hyperbola out far, so far, and it can't be moved any farther and still satisfy the constraint. Okay, so does everyone see that one? So then this, right, this particular rectangle is going to turn out to be the optimal rectangle. 
the one with the maximum area. <coughs> okay, and this general idea of taking the two functions, holding and considering the isocontours of both of them, holding one of the isocontours fixed, in this case the constraint isocontour fixed, and then moving the area isocontours <coughs> until they just barely satisfy the constraint. Okay, this is a this is a general procedure, and it is called uh, the method of Lagrange. Okay, so then I'm not going to take this problem any further. I just wanted to motivate it. Or I will take it further, but not exactly now. In about five minutes, I wanted to use this to motivate the notion of using isocontours. <coughs> okay, so any questions about this before I? jump into what Lagrange's theorem is. Well, we're about to see that. Other questions? So that's the next thing I'm going to talk about. So wh why is, why, it's a very good question, why is this the optimal point? Okay, so that's the purpose of today's lecture. Okay. So here we have Lagrange's theorem. Okay, so Lagrange is a famous French guy. I make no warranty about me pronouncing his name correct. I'm probably not. Okay, he <coughs> is the one that first came up with this, with this kind of thing. So let F and G be smooth functions. <coughs> Okay, that is to say that they have continuous first partials. So, F and G are both smooth. <coughs> and then such that such that F of X and Y has an extremum at x0, y0 on the constraint curve g of x and y is equal to 0. So this is the same this is the setup we had last time, so on the previous page. I said, well, here we said f is 4xy, and g is x squared over 3 squared plus y squared over 4 squared minus 1. And so what my claim to you was is that, okay, the function f, <coughs> the area of the rectangle, has an extremum at this particular point. Okay. Then, <coughs> this is the claim of Lagrange, Lagrange's theorem. Then there is a real number lambda so then this is a Greek letter that you may not be accustomed to writing if it's pronounced lambda such that <coughs> the gradient of f of x 0 y 0 is equal to a multiple lambda <coughs> of the gradient of g of x0, y0. Okay, now this is a lot of writing, and the geometry can be kind of obscured of what's happening here. So first off, first off, lambda is a Greek letter and it's the phonetic equivalent of the Latin L, and therefore Latin phonetic equivalent of English L. So why was Lambda chosen? Because the guy's name is Lagrange, which starts with L. Okay, That's why Lambda was chosen. Okay, There's nothing special about that letter, and it lo may look strange to you, but all it is is a letter. Okay, So then <coughs> you have some letter here. So then now the gradient is a vector. The gradient of F is a vector, and the gradient of G is a vector. 
the gradient of f is a vector, <coughs> the gradient of g is a vector. So what does it mean to say that one vector is a multiple of another vector, geome geometrically speaking? What does it mean if, if, u is a, if u and v are vectors and u is a scalar multiple of v? Then these two vectors are parallel. Ah, okay. So then some of the geometry is starting to peek through now. This means that the gradients are parallel. Or anti-parallel. Right. They could be, right, so then it depends on whether lambda is positive or negative. Okay, and in fact, this turns out to be a very important thing if you go on in math and optimization and things like this. It's ver it will be very important if you determine that the multiplier is positive or negative depending on how you set up the problem. Actually, in this class, we don't care. We don't ever even mention it. Okay, if it, if it does it matter if it's positive or negative. Okay, so then any question, <coughs> any question about this? such that, so then there's a real number, and then I need to add a caveat here, <coughs> and this is if the gradient of g of x and y uh, at x0, y0 is not a zero vector. So if the gradient <coughs> of the constraint is zero, if the gradient of the constraint is zero, then the method, this theorem is not going to end up being correct. It, it may end up not being correct. Okay, so then before we actually show that this is, that this is in fact correct, that this statement I've written is correct, <coughs> let's just review here. So what it's saying is that, okay, if you have some function f that you wish to optimize, okay, so typically this is called the objective function. Okay, it's called the objective because it's what you want, like you want to optimize your profit. Right, your objective is to op optimize profit. Okay, F will be called the objective. G is called the constraint. Right, so then a typical constraint where profit is concerned is that you want to optimize your profit within the boundaries of the law. <laughs> right? you, have to, you have to do it in that way. Right? You can't do things that are extra legal. Okay, so then, then there is a multiplier. Right? A multiplier lambda such that the gradient of the objective is parallel to the gradient of the constraint. Okay, that is to say, algebraically, that the gradient and the constraint are scalar multiples of each other. Okay, so long as the gradient is non-zero. Okay, so then let's show that this is true. <coughs> now, <coughs> so f and g are both smooth. They're smooth functions, and this in particular also means that the level curve g equal to zero is a smooth function. Okay, so moreover, moreover, the level curve g equal to zero is some kind of function, and I could write it as a function, the type of function that we already studied, a planar curve. Right, so I can write it as a planar curve. So then let r of t equal to x of t, y of t, be a planar curve. <coughs> which traces out g of x and y equal to zero <coughs> through x0, y0 <coughs> such that the derivative of r of t is not the zero vector. That is to say that, okay, I'm taking the constraint. So for example, on the previous example, the ellipse. And what I'm saying is that R of T, R of T is a planar curve, which is tracing that ellipse 
and going through the optimal point, the point we're, we're claiming to be optimal, and this trace does not have a place where the derivative is zero. And so such a tracing is called a smooth, a smooth embedding to a mathematician. Okay, so does everybody sort of understand what's, what I'm saying here? There's a function, r of t, I'm tracing out the, the constraint curve, and it goes through the point I'm claiming to be optimal, and at no, at no time is the derivative of my planar curve equal to zero in both components. Okay, then I'm going to define h of t to be f <coughs> to be f of r of t, like so. Okay, that is to say, that is to say that f of x of t, y of t. Okay, so <coughs> f, the domain of f is vectors. So what I'm saying is that now I have this vector-valued function, and I'm using it to trace out the curve. So then you can see that that f, okay, h is a function of t because I'm saying that I'm taking f and plugging in to each coordinate functions of t. So h is a function of t. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so then, since h is a function of t and f has an extremum, f has an extremum, since f has an extremum at uh, at x0, y0, and since h of t is a differentiable function by its construction, by its <coughs> construction then we can use the calculus one extreme value theorem so the extreme value theorem says that <coughs> the maximum or the extremum of h of t <coughs> occurs, or we'll not say occurs, the extremum is whatever value this gives, f of x0, y0. And since I said that r of t has to go through that point, there has to be some value t0 such that you can say h of t0 gives you f of x0, y0. Okay, so then the calculus one extreme theorem, extreme value theorem is saying that we can find that point t0. But moreover, the extreme value theorem t said another thing about functions. So in the calculus one extreme value theorem, that was the case when you were trying to find the optimal points of a function over an interval. Right, the optimal points of a function over an interval. So, <coughs> The optimal points, according to the extreme value theorem, are guaranteed to occur at what, <coughs> what kinds of places? End points or critical points? Right? End points or critical points. Okay, so then we've already arranged matters so that the function traces across, traces across the extreme, uh, the extremum, x0, y0. So then the extremum is not occurring at an end point. Okay, so then this extremum, therefore, by the extreme value theorem, must be occurring at a critical point. It has to be occurring at a critical point. So this is saying that T0 is a critical number of H of T. Now, what kind of thing, what makes a, a T0, what makes a number a critical number in Calculus 1? What must be true there? The derivative must be zero or undefined. But the way we constructed H, the way we constructed H, what's true about its derivatives? It's always defined. 
right? We constructed it so that it always has derivatives that are defined. So what is true about h of t0? Right, there are only two possibilities. h of t0 must be either 0 or undefined. And so it must be 0. Because h of t0 must be defined. <coughs> Excuse me. So then it's not h of t0 is 0. What should this be? It should be h prime of t0 <coughs> is equal to 0. Okay. So now we have enough information to proceed algebraically. So then we defined h to be f of x of t, y of t, like so. And now we know in particular, in particular, that t0 is an extremum of h. And we also know that the derivative of h evaluated at t0 has to be 0. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this piece of information and this piece of information and combine them. Right? All the stuff in between between the two red boxes, all the words and everything was just so I could get these two pieces together. So now that I have these two pieces, <coughs> I'm going to compute the derivative of h. So the derivative of h, <coughs> according to the chain rule, is equal to, do you remember? So do you remember the chain rule for functions of multiple variables? I hope so. That was also something we went over last week. Or not last week, right? Last week was break, so two weeks ago. Okay, <laughs> so I'll, I'll write it like this, right? It's df, dx, and then dx, dt, plus df, dy, dy, dt. So, why am I using two different kinds of d's? Right, one is a partial derivative. Okay, so then the partial of f with respect to x is signifying that you understand that f is a function of multiple things. So you're computing a derivative of f, but it's only partially a derivative. Okay, then the dx dt is saying that you understand that x is a function of exactly one quantity t. So then this right, is a partial of f, and this is the derivative of x. Okay, so at any rate, at any rate, you could factor, you could factor the partial of f and the partial of y into a vector, into a single vector, so what is that single vector called? The gradient, right, so then that's the gradient of f <coughs> of x evaluated at t, y evaluated at t. And then scalar product. Now, dx dt, dy dt, what's that? Hmm. So how about what's r of t? r of t is x, y. So then now, what if I compute the derivative of each component? Then now, what is that called? r prime of t. So this is r prime of t. <coughs> so now if I plug in the particular value at t0, then I have the gradient of f <coughs> of x evaluated at t0, y evaluated at t0, like so. <coughs> okay, so then now what I can say is, okay, this is the point that I said where the function has an extremum. Okay, this is where the function has an extremum, and I know from the previous information that it must be true that the derivative of h is 0, so now I can say that this is 0. <coughs> so 0 is equal to the gradient of f evaluated at x of t0, and I'm going to rewrite this <coughs> like so, r evaluated at t0, scalar product r prime evaluated at t0. So now I know another thing. 
Now I know another thing, and I know that r prime evaluated at t0 is not what? I know that it's certainly not 0. Right? This this term is not 0. <coughs> okay? In particular, it's not 0 and it is also tangent to the constraint. It's tangent to the constraint. So now, what do we have here? I have that two vectors, their scalar product is zero. So how are they situated geometrically? Orthogonally, right? So this is telling me, this is telling me that the gradient of f evaluated at r of t zero is orthogonal to the constraint curve. It's orthogonal to the constraint curve. So then now, consider the constraint curve. Right? The constraint curve, now I'm going to use the fact that the constraint curve is an <coughs> isocontour. It's an isocontour. Okay? And also the fact that this is happening in two dimensions. So then I have a, how are the, how is the gradient of an isocontour, uh, the gradient of a function related to its isocontours? geometrically speaking. So do you remember the picture? Spring break is always killer. <laughs> Spring break destroys everything. So then, so let's just sketch over here in this blank space that I have. So let's say that I have some level curves of a function here, <coughs> like these ones. And so maybe this is like the the side of a, the topography of a mountain. Okay, and let's say that this right here, this point, this is the top of the mountain, right? This highest point. So then, please sketch for me how the gradient would appear right here. It would be orthogonal to the isocontour and pointing in the uphill direction. Right? So something like this. So how is the gradient of a function related to the isocontours of the function? They are orthogonal, orthogonal. So then, what I'm saying, what's being said here is that the gradient okay, is orthogonal to the constraint curve. And also, because this is in two dimensions, if I take the orthogonal direction to the constraint curve, then that is parallel to the direction of the gradient of the constraint. So these two things together are telling me that the gradient of f evaluated r of t0 is parallel to the gradient of g evaluated at r of t0. Okay, and that's what we wanted to show. And that's what we wanted to show. <coughs> Okay, so then, a little bit abstract, maybe. But this is the kind of thing that mathematicians do all the time. Okay, so any question about this argument? Okay, so I have some good news. The good news is, is that you're not going to have to reproduce this argument. Okay, and actually solving these problems is easier, is you will find them, I expect, to be easier than this consideration. Okay, so any questions before we get to that? Okay, so then that thing that we just went through was the justification for what I'm about to say. Okay, so this right here, this is called the method of Lagrange multipliers. So then, suppose f of x and y and g of x and y satisfy, satisfy 
the conditions of Lagrange's theorem. That is to say that they're both smooth. F has an extremum at x0, y0. The gradient is non-zero at x0, y0. The gradient of the constraint is non-zero at x0, y0, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. <coughs> then, to find the optimal points of f of x and y subject to subject to the constraint <coughs> g of x and y is equal to zero you follow out you carry out the following steps <coughs> one compute both gradients Compute the gradient of f, compute the gradient of y, or the gradient of g. Two. Solve the equation. The gradient of f of x and y is equal to lambda times the gradient of g of x and y. Okay, and you will solve this for how many variables are in this equation? How many variables? Not so I'll give you a hint. It's not two. Okay, I'll give you another hint. It's three. So then <laughs> so what are the names of the variables? X, Y, and Lambda. For X, Y, and Lambda. Okay, then three. Let's say that you find, let's say that you do this and you find n solutions. So, you know, realistic problem that I give you will be between one and one and four solutions. Okay. Then, <coughs> the largest Now let's say let's say it like this. Evaluate evaluate f of x and y at each solution from the previous step and then for the largest evaluation <coughs> gives the maximum and the smallest the minimum. <coughs> so then, this is a very nice procedure, right? It's just got a few steps. It basically comes down to this. I give you a problem, and then you say, this function is the objective, this other one's the constraint. I'll compute the gradients of both. Okay, now I solve a system of equations. The gradient <coughs> is, oh, wait, so then solve, <laughs> no, sorry, then there's another, there's another equation here that I didn't write. You must also solve, <laughs> so then now, let, let, let's understand, before I correct myself, I want, I want to say this. So what would this equation say? This equation says what geometrically? It means that the gradient of the objective is, p is parallel <coughs> or anti-parallel to the gradient of the constraint. Okay, that's necessary. But what else must be satisfied? I, it's not just that the gradients have to be parallel or anti-parallel. You must also satisfy the constraint. <laughs> you must also satisfy the constraint. So then it must also be true that g of x and y is zero. <laughs> Okay. 
k. So then without that green bit there that I wrote there, g of x and y is 0, it would be like if I asked, it, that would mean that I could ask you the question, tell me the tallest mountain on the Earth, and you say, Mons Olympus. Okay, so then that's the tallest mountain on the, in the solar system, but not on the Earth. Okay, so then you find, you solve this system of equations, you find several solutions, right? There could be, there could be millions of solutions. In practice, there's going to be between one and four solutions, something like that. Okay, so you evaluate at each one of the solutions. The biggest one will tell you the max. The smallest one will tell you the min. Now, the book is unclear on the next point, and so I want to say this. If, if g of x and y is unbounded, then there may not be extrema so that is to say that if you are optimizing over a bounded constraint so for example you're optimizing over an ellipse like the first problem that I gave you if you're optimizing over the ellipse then you will certainly find maxes and mins but if you're optimizing over something that's not bounded, so someone give me an example of a graph which isn't bounded. What? Hyperbola. Right? Hyperbola is not a bounded. It's not a bounded thing. So then, if you're constrained to move along a hyperbola, then you may not find a max or a min. So then, I don't know why the book doesn't go into that matter, but whatever. So there's a lot of things we could say, but basically we sort of skirt the issue a little bit at, at this level of calculus. So then you could say that it's unbounded. But the questions that I give you, I'll always say something like, find the minimum. Okay, so then I won't say find all of the extreme, I'll say find the minimum, or I'll say find the maximum. And w you, can, you can take it as given that whatever instruction I say to you is a legitimate instruction. Right, so... <laughs> If I say find the minimum, then there is one. Right. Okay. So then I may play I may play some games and say something like show that this doesn't have a minimum. Okay, but that's still a legitimate instruction. I won't ever give you, I won't ever try and trick you and say find the minimum and your, the correct response is there is none. Okay, so I won't play that game at this level. Okay, so then the method of Lagrange multipliers. So now let's use it to solve. The met let's use the method of Lagrange multipliers to solve the opening question. Okay, that is to say, <coughs> we take that ellipse, okay, and we can move that point around on the ellipse in the first quadrant. From that point, we consider the corresponding rectangle, and we want to find the rectangle that has maximum area that is inscribed in the ellipse. <coughs> okay. So then the ellipse looks something something like this. <coughs> okay, so I'll call this point XY. Okay, so then <coughs> this ellipse is given by x squared over 3 squared plus y squared over 4 squared is equal to 1. Okay, so then we already said these things, but the, the height of the rectangle is 2y and the base of the rectangle is 2x. So then I can say the following, that the objective function... is f of x and y is equal to what? What's the objective function? 4xy. The constraint, the constraint function is g of x and y equal to what? Yes, x squared over 3 squared plus y squared over 4 squared <coughs> 
minus 1, and the constraint specifically is that the constraint function has to be equal to 0. <coughs> Okay, so then the solutions that we find are going to be in the first quadrant. Okay, so now let's use the method of Lagrange multiplier. So first, <coughs> compute the gradient of f. <coughs> so the gradient of f in the first component is 4y and in the second 4x. So is there any question why that's the case? And then the gradient of G. Okay, so in the first component, it is what? 2 ninths X. And in the second component, uh, what? 1, so 2 sixteenths Y. <coughs> so any question why that's the case? So there's the two gradients. So now we need to solve the system of equations, 4y is equal to <coughs> lambda multiplied by 2 over 9x, right? So that is to say that the first partial, the fx is lambda times gx, okay? And further, that 4x is equal to lambda times 2 over 16y. Okay, and then what is the, so what does this represent? These two represent what? If these two equations are satisfied, then what does that say geometrically? That the gradients are parallel. Okay, but that's not the only thing that's necessary. Besides the gradients being parallel, what must also be true? The constraint must be satisfied also. So that is the last equation. So x squared over 3 squared has to, uh, plus y squared over 4 squared is equal to 1. So this one is saying that the constraint is satisfied. So then now, all of the previous work in calculus and things, it all comes down to here's three equations and three unknowns. The three unknowns are x, y, and lambda. The whole thing now is an algebraic problem. You algebraically solve this equation. So <coughs> someone give me some strategy on how I can proceed. So do what? Okay, so then I need to solve for one of the variables and start plugging that into the other one. So then now, another thing that's important in this class is that even though lambda is one of the things that you that is a variable, in this class we actually don't care about what lambda is. In other math classes, especially if you go on to mathematical finance and other kinds of types of optimization problems, then the value of lambda will be very important. <laughs> but it's not important in this class. So what that means as an upshot means that you should almost always try to solve for lambda first. Okay? Because if you solve for lambda first, that means that you will obtain its value last. Okay? So then that means that you don't have to do the last step because you don't care what lambda is anyway. So then you should always solve for lambda first. So then <coughs> in this equation, for example, in this equation, for example, I can solve for lambda. So I'll use 4y is equal to lambda multiplied by 2 over 9th x. <coughs> so then I could say that this means that I could solve for lambda and say that lambda is equal to 4 over y multiplied by what? Uh, 9 over 2x. Okay, so then I could say that lambda Lambda is equal to this 4 cancels with that 2. So then that's what my brain is shutting down. 18y over x. Okay, so lambda is 18y over x. Okay, <coughs> now we can take this lambda and plug it into the next equation. Right, so then now I'll take this piece of information, plug it into the next equation. 
So now I have that 4x, 4x is equal to 18y over x multiplied by 2 over 16y. <coughs> okay, so then I can multiply both sides by x and get that 4x squared, <coughs> excuse me, is equal to uh, something y squared. So then 2 over 16, that's 1 over 8. Okay, and this is 18 over 8, so that's 9 over 4. Is that right? So 4x squared is 9 over 4y squared. Okay, so now, now what? I could solve for x squared and then plug that into the next equation. Okay, so then I can say that x squared is equal to 9 over 16y squared. Okay, so now I can take this piece and plug it into this one. And my solutions <coughs> always end up looking like Madden diagrams. <laughs> okay, so then now I can take that piece and say, okay, uh, 9 over 16y squared over 3 squared, which is 9, plus y squared over 4 squared, which is 16, should be equal to 1. Okay, so then this 9, this 9 is canceled by that 9, so this is 9 over 9. So then this is y squared over 16 plus y squared over 16 is equal to 1. So that's 2y squared over 16, which is to say y squared over 8 is equal to, is equal to 1. So y squared is equal to 8. Okay, so then now we can solve for y. There are two possible solutions. y is equal to the square root of 8, or y is equal to negative the square root of 8. But one of these does not belong. Which one does not belong? The negative one. Why doesn't the negative one belong? Because we said that we're going to find things in the first quadrant. Right, so not this one, because this is not in the first quadrant. <coughs> okay, so then now that we've determined that y is the square root of 8, we can determine what x is. So using that, we can say that x squared should be 9 over 16 times the square root of 8 squared. So the square root of 8 squared is 8, is 8, so that x squared is equal to uh, what, 9 over 2? Okay, 9 over 2, so then x has two possible solutions. x is equal to 3 over the square root of 2, or x is equal to negative 3 over the square root of 2, but one of these does not belong, okay, because it's not in the first quadrant. So then the only solution is is xy is equal to 3 over the square root of 2, comma, what was the other one? The square root of 8. Okay, so then, but this, this still isn't the answer to the question yet. This still isn't the answer to the question. What, what was the question that I was asking? <laughs> Everybody, wait, what was the question that was being asked? <laughs> find the maximum area, right? So evidently, evidently, right, I gave you a question. I said, find the, maxim find the maximum, right? So then evidently, if, as long as what we did before is correct, then this is where the maximum occurs, but you still haven't told me what the maximum is, so the question is not answered. So, the maximum, max m, um, area is, so how do you figure out what the maximum area is? You plug it into 4xy, right? You plug it into the objective function f. That will be, I need to plug in 3 over the square root of 2 and the square root of 8. Okay, so then 
just to copy this down. This is 4xy. So then that will be 4 multiplied by the square uh, 3 over the square root of 2 multiplied by the square root of 8. So then now the square root of 8, right, the square root of 8, 8 is 4 times 2, so the square root of 8 is 2 times the square root of 2, so this is equal to 4 times 3 over the square root of 2 multiplied by 2 square root 2. So the square root of 2's cancel, and then this is 4 times 3, which is 12 times 2, which is 24. So that's it. That's the biggest you could make a rectangle in there. It has size 24. Okay, see you on Thursday. Tomorrow? No. Next week. <coughs> the stuff I went over at the very beginning, yes.